Well, welcome to today's video. Now, one of the things that's been concerning me for some time, really since back in January, was are there going to be any long-term complications of, of COVID-19? Long-term sequelae, because we get this in other diseases. So it wouldn't be surprising if you got it in COVID-19. And particularly, there did seem to be quite a lot of it after the SARS 2003 the severe acute respiratory syndrome, the, the coronavirus type 1 way back in 2003, and the Middle East respiratory syndrome, fortunately fairly uncommon, but quite a serious condition. So in previous coronavirus infections, there does seem to have been these sequelae. So this has been the concern. So we're starting to get some evidence now, and there's programs in hand to get fairly definitive evidence on this as well. So let's look at where we are up to at the time being as regards this long COVID, what are sometimes called long haulers. And we have talked to some on this channel and uh, some people have been quite badly debilitated by this condition. But let's look at it anyway. So we're looking at evidence, not at, uh, not at opinion and, uh, and distorted memories or potentially distorted memories. Right, this paper here, Long-Term Health Consequences of COVID-19, Journal of the American Medical Association, published on the 5th of October. Now, this paper seems to kind of try and define what we're talking about. Ongoing symptoms to substantial end organ dysfunction. So what it's saying is there's quite a large variety of possible manifestations of this post-acute COVID syndrome. Sometimes it's mild and transitory. Other times it can lead to significant effects and even damage to the organs. And some organs will heal, but other organs won't. So potential for a wide spectrum of, of possible long-term complications is, is what it's saying. Now, just to be fair, most people don't get this. This is going to be the minority. But the question is, how big a minority is it going to turn out to be? But do, do read this for yourself. Now, they sort of distinguish two conditions, really. There's post-acute COVID, uh, persistent symptoms beyond three weeks. So what this is saying is that most patients can make a, a good recovery within two weeks. And this isn't three weeks, sorry, beyond be, two, two to three weeks is a good recovery. So if it persists beyond three weeks, it, it's described as post-acute COVID. Now, this isn't surprising that you get symptoms for a few weeks because yourself, if you've had influenza, you don't feel good for a, a few weeks after that. You, you know, you can you can actually be under the weather for a while, lacking energy. It can take a long time to get back. So there seems to be this aspect of COVID, as we would expect with any acute viral infection. But sometimes, post-acute COVID, symptoms persist beyond three weeks. So that's the first one, post-acute COVID. But what about longer term? Well, they describe it as chronic COVID. If the symptoms last beyond about three months, 12 weeks, then it becomes chronic. And we've talked to people on this channel who've had symptoms since back in March. So this is a definite, definite phenomena. Now, the BBC did a survey looking at uh, common complaints. What do people commonly complain of weeks or, or even months after their acute episode of COVID-19? Uh, well, one of the main ones seems to be crippling fatigue. Now, this is described by some people as like a, a fatigue they've never had before. They're just totally mentally and physically exhausted. So this crippling, debilitating fatigue you know, sometimes you and me will feel tired and we think, oh, I'm a bit tired today, but you go to work anyway. You just you just sort of motivate yourself, have a shower, try and get going and, and, and you go into work and you do your day's work. These people are completely incapable of that. The fatigue is crippling. They cannot overcome it with willpower. It, it, is, it is more than just tiredness. Breathlessness is a common feature as well. Shortness of breath, especially on exercise. Persistent cough joint pain, muscle aches, and even chest pain, which of course is a very disconcerting feature. And one feature that the BBC didn't come up with that we have talked about a couple of times on this channel that people have reported to me is a fast heart rate. So when they exercise, the heart rate becomes very fast, what we call tachycardia. Uh, they seem to have a very vigorous heart response to any exercise. Um, anyway, carrying on with the list from the BBC, hearing and eyesight problems, headaches, loss of smell and taste. So this anosmia can persist in a minority of people. 
damage to the heart, lungs, kidneys and gut. So actual organ damage can occur. Now, again, depression and anxiety after a viral infection are not surprising. Post-viral depression is, is, is a common or post any significant illness, depression is, is a well-recognised uh, condition. People get it, they usually recover from it. But it seems to be occurring here as well. Um, is it occurring more than other viral infections, of course, is the question we're looking at. So depression, anxiety, struggling to think clearly. And people have described this sort of brain fog. Now, this is very hard to explain. It's also sometimes described as derealization syndrome derealization syndrome now i've had this and i think i had it as a result of stress i had an episode of it about 10 years ago and it's absolutely horrible you, you feel you you look around and you think well i'm not really here things around you don't seem real cognitively you know they are but they don't seem real and, and it's almost as if you're watching yourself on a video it's, it's a horrible feature, this derealization that the world around is not real. It's a real disconcerting feeling and you, you really struggle to make contact with reality. It's as if people around you are on a video, not real. Um, so uh, that, 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 is, that, is, that will be a concerning feature. Again, it's one of these brain type features, anxiety, depression, struggling to think clearly, brain fog, derealization. Now, this is interesting. There's two competing views on this at the moment that the likelihood of getting this post-covid syndrome or some of this post-covid syndrome a syndrome of course means a wide range of possible clinical features so a syndrome what we've just described is possible features of this syndrome any one individual hopefully will only have one or two of these well hopefully none so it's a wide range of possible features this syndrome but the question is, how related is it to how severe the condition was? So some people are thinking, well, you're more likely to get it with severe disease. Other people are thinking, well, no, this is more idiosyncratic. People with even minor COVID can be left with long-term sequelae. Now, the evidence is not clear <clears throat> fully on this at the moment, but the evidence we're going to present today would indicate that the more severe the condition, the more severe or the greater the greater the probability of sequelae are but that's not known for sure yet so could some people get relatively minor disease and have longer term sequelae y y yes that that's possible is that the most common situation no probably not but we don't have enough data to be definitive uh, some cases do seem to be related to pneumonia which of course is a serious condition and of course I, i've uh, worked with many people who've had pneumonia and uh, they do take, it, it takes them a long time to recover because it's a severe infection and inflammation in the lungs and it does take a while to recover. Now, um, <clears throat> going on to the next paper. Symptom duration and risk factors for delayed return to usual health among outpatients. So this is outpatients. These are people who have not been hospitalised with COVID-19. Study carried out by the United States Centers for Disease Control. So this is people who were not sick enough to go into hospital. How did they do after the acute episode of COVID? Well, this is a random sample of uh, 292, not huge. 274 met the criteria um, by giving full data. Now, 35% of these symptomatic responders had not returned to usual health after 14 to 16 days, had not returned to usual health. And this was different depending on the age, which is not really surprising. We'd expect young people to bounce back quicker. And that is exactly what happened. So let's look at the figures. 18 to, 30, for 18 to 34 year olds, 85 of those, 26% had not returned to normal. In other words, 74% had returned to normal. I hope that makes sense. It's just that, that, that this study expressed it in the negative. So 26% had not returned to normal, therefore 70% had. And this is within about two weeks after the illness. So most young people, they're bouncing back nicely. 35 to 49 year olds, 32% had not returned to normal, therefore 68% had. So again, people with minor illness, the majority bouncing back after a couple of weeks, but not all. And then 50 and older, 
it's getting on for half and half. 47% had not returned to normal, so just over half had returned to normal in the older age group. So we see there that people with minor illness, most of them returning to normal. Now it's frustrating that we don't have data for the month after and the month after and the month after, but this was just at this one endpoint of 14 to 16 days. But it is showing that most people are making a reasonable recovery, roughly as we would expect, with what is a significant viral illness. So, um, but not all, but not all. Some people still having lingering symptoms after the two week mark. Now, we do know, and this is well known, that people who have been very sick uh, can take a year or so to recover. This, this is well known. Um, so, for example, we have post-intensive care syndrome. Um, being an in intensive care is a major trauma to the mind and the body. It really is. Um, you know, we have, I've worked on intensive care units and um, it, it, is, it is a major insult you know, to keep people alive sometimes but um, uh, it's not surprising that there's a post-intensive care syndrome that takes a while to recover. Um, six to twelve months is typical to recover. Uh, thinking might not be as good as it should be, cognitive function, mental health, depression, anxiety, panic attacks and physical dysfunction all can manage, last for six months to twelve months after an episode in intensive care. Not at all surprising. Because the person's been sick enough to go to intensive care and they've been on intensive care. Now, if you take a perfectly healthy person and put them onto intensive care, they could probably suffer similar things. But if they've been sick or traumatised as well, that's not surprising. So this isn't way out of um, expectations so far. Um, although there are some reasons to be concerned, as we'll see. Uh, persistent symptoms in patients after acute COVID-19. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association publication, and this work was done in Rome. Again, frustratingly small sample sizes. Now we'll see this is being well and truly rectified, but this is what we've got at the moment. Um, 143 patients discharged from hospital. So these patients, in contrast to the Centers for Disease Control study, were hospitalized they were sicker individuals so how did they get on did they fare better or worse well as you would expect they fared somewhat worse because they'd been sicker 18 patients 12.6 percent were completely free of any COVID-19 relation symptoms after two months 60 days so the vast that well there we have it 87.4 uh, percent are not returned to normal after two months so from these two studies, and it, there only are two studies, relatively small sample size, these are intimating uh, that people who have more severe disease are going to be, uh, have a longer recovery period. So here in these hospitalised patients, we see that 87% had not returned to full normal after two months. Quite, quite, uh, quite a long time, really. Now, this study also identified the clinical features, the manifestations that these people were suffering from. So let's look at what uh, those manifestations were. This long COVID, if we get rid of me, we'll be able to see it. This long COVID or these, uh, these longer hauling patients. Yep, right. Percentage of patients with symptoms. So... Um, we, here we have the 40% uh, line. This is the 40% line up, up here. So that's 40%. Uh, that's 20%. That's, uh, that's Roughly there. So um, fatigue, well, we're seeing that, well, more than 50% of patients have ongoing fatigue, this extreme, uh, often extreme tiredness, varying degrees of tiredness, but sometimes extreme tiredness that has been reported. Shortness of breath, especially on exercise. Um, that's it. Joint pain, chest pain, chest pain really quite common there, around about 20%. Then uh, less common cough, uh, anosmia, uh, Sickier syndrome, not quite sure what they mean by that actually. R runny nose, red eyes, loss of taste, 
headache, sputum production, more sputum, lack of appetite, sore throat, vertigo, that dizzy spinning feeling, muscle pain and uh, diarrhea, a bit of an ongoing feature as well. Um, so wide variety of uh, complaints there. And remember these were going on for, um, this, this was, this, the end point here was 60 days. So this is quite a long time after. Now, none of the patients in this age, uh, longer age group had fever or any signs of the acute illness. So the manifestations were very different to the acute illness. And 44%, 44.1%, two months after, reported a significant reduction in their quality of life. This was affecting people, not returning to normal. So... Um, Limited data so far, but that's what we've got. And so far it's indicating that the more severe the condition, the more likely someone is to have the sequelae for a longer period of time. And as, as we say, we have talked to people who've still got sequelae from back in March. So for some people, the minority, this could go on for longer. Um, now what's going wrong here? Pathogenesis. What, what begins this patho disease, genesis beginning? Um, what begins these long-term sequelae. Right, so one is direct tissue invasion by the virus. The virus clears from most of the body but lingers in some small areas. Interesting, the immune system fails to clear it in some areas. So if there's long-term diarrhea, then you'll find the virus in the gut, in the gastrointestinal tract. If there's loss of smell, uh, it's in the nerves. So that would be what's causing the problem and that's from, that's from Tim Spector from the COVID symptom tracker app. So interesting that what it seems here, and I must say this is, this is surprising, but what it seems is the virus is cleared from the body in some people so that they're no longer acutely ill, but you get little pockets of the virus remaining in, in a nerve, for example, the, the olfactory nerve going to the, uh, from the nose to the brain or in the gastrointestinal tract that it's not cleared. That's, that's Tim Spector's view. Um, okay, well, more evidence will, will show, but, but uh, that, okay. Um, strains that the immune system... You'd you know, you'd really think if the immune system cleared it from one place, it cleared it from everywhere. But there again, it could be recycling within the body or something. There are conditions where people reinfect themselves, but and anyway, it doesn't quite make sense. But that, that's what Tim Spector's saying at the moment. We'll go with that for now. Um, metabolic effects... Yes, effects on the metabolism. Now, there's certainly some people have developed diabetes after COVID-19. And people with diabetes, uh, it can really knock their sugar controls off and the blood sugar, the blood glucose can go way high, making the diabetes very difficult to manage. And we know that people with diabetes are more prone to severe disease as well. So we have this two-way thing with diabetes. We have the diabetes, meaning that severe COVID is more likely. And we have the, the COVID, meaning that the diabetes is destabilised. Or for people without diabetes, diabetes can actually be induced. Now, there is a little bit of detail in this paper here. Do follow that up if you're interested. Um, but what seems to be happening normally with viral infection... Typically, what we believe happens is that the body develops uh, immunity to a virus, antibodies to a virus. And these, uh, these antibodies go to the, uh, the pancreas, which is just here. So the pancreas is there, head and the tail of the pancreas is over there, upper abdomen at the back. And, and the pancreas produces uh, insulin, special cells called the pancreatic islets of Langerhans. And uh, those cells can be damaged by the immunological reaction to the virus. Um, meaning that diabetes, we're talking about the type 1 diabetes here, it is in fact um, an autoimmune disease in, most, in many cases. In many cases. So is that what is, that, what, is, that what, what is happening here? Um, it could be, um, but we don't know how common this is. Let's hope it's not very common. But there's certainly this bad interaction between uh, COVID-19 and diabetes. I just say that people with uh, type 2 diabetes um, also 
um, uh, prone to more severe COVID-19 as well as people with type 1 diabetes. Um, profound, profound inflammation and the cytokine storm. Remember the cytokine of these inflammatory mediators released by one cell, cyto cell kine movement have an influence on other cells so cytokine storm um, now we know that this can cause the uh, the alveoli to fill up with fluid at the time this acute respiratory distress syndrome but it also seems to me mean that sometimes the immune system does not return to normal check it out in this immunological uh, publication now there's two sorts of immunological problems one is that the immune system is no longer combating the infections an immune deficiency but another immunological problem is that the immune system is overactive and is starting to attack the body's own tissues so-called autoimmune reactions that's why we need this immunomodulating effect so we don't want too much immunity but we don't want not enough either so um, both of those seeming to be potentially affected after some people with COVID-19 in this long, causing this long-term condition, potential ongoing immunological effects. Um, again, limited data, but but what we have is in these uh, in these publications. I'm giving you the links for. Now, frank organ damage is is perhaps the most frightening, and as we've said, this is seen in the Middle East respiratory syndrome, and the severe acute respiratory syndrome, what we could call SARS-1. Um, back in 2003. Now this virus no longer exists, unfortunately. The MERS virus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, as far as I know, there's been no cases of human to human transmission of MERS for years because people know about it and it's not transmissible from human to human like sars coronavirus 2 The great thing about the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is although it's a severe disease, people are most infectious when they're most sick. So you don't get this, uh, you don't get this pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic spread to anything like the same degree that you get with COVID-19. But there's odd cases and the virus jumps, it's a spillover, a zoonotic infection from uh, camels, mostly in the Middle East where they keep camels, uh, jumps from camels into, uh, into humans occasionally and, and causes a severe illness, but it doesn't spread from human to human as long as proper precautions are taken and, and the precautions are much easier to take than they are for COVID-19. Uh, for COVID but similar coronavirus and organ damage has been seen in these conditions. And the organ damage has been identified by this paper here. Again, this paper is looking into research for Mar MERS and SARS, not coronavirus too, unlike the other ones which we have been looking at, which are specific to coronavirus. SARS coronavirus 2 COVID-19 disease. This one is this research here is related to MERS and SARS 2003 and it's found lung function abnormalities, psychological impairment and reduced exercise capacity. Now given that these occurred after a very similar coronavirus it wouldn't be surprising and basically we are seeing these things from SARS coronavirus 2 in SARS coronavirus 2 sequelae. Now brain alterations are another one. Um, now again we do know these occur, this is a publication from The Lancet. Uh, cerebral, that's to do with the cerebrum as the outer part of the brain. Microstructural changes in COVID-19 patients. So there's not big parts of the brain changes but there's microstructural changes. Uh, to the small scale structure of the brain, the outer part of the brain, which is the cerebrum. So the outer part of the brain is the cerebrum. That's the bit you're kind of thinking with. The lower part of the brain is the, is the, uh, the cerebellum and the brain stem. Uh, this is the, the, the top part of the brain. The cerebrum uh, can, be, can be affected. Um, the outer part of the cerebrum, of course, is the cerebral cortex, which is probably what you've, uh, you've heard of that probably. What, what you're thinking with now in fact um, so th these occur again how common they are what else we don't know too much about it but they do definitely occur and this has been done by magne magnetic resonance imaging scanning 
uh, MRI scanning, and that is an exquisitely detailed technique. You can I remember the first time I was at work and I saw an MRI picture, I couldn't believe it. The, the detail was just incredible on the anatomy, something like the brain, you can see great, great detail. Um, so if that's what those studies are showing, then then that, that's pretty diagnostic that that is happening. Um, now, hypercoagulable states, increased blood clotting, increased coagulation of the blood. We know that occurs, that can cause lots of little microthrombi in the acute disease, which can block off small blood vessels. Um, we know that occurs. Um, in some patients, this does seem to be ongoing. And there's the possibility of blood vessel damage in some patients. Evidence for that's not very clear yet. Uh, but inflammation of some blood vessels and possibly, uh, I haven't got the reference for that, but that's from the WHO, has speculated about uh, inflammation of the coronary arteries. And the coronary arteries, of course, are the arteries that supply the heart. So if that were to happen, that would be a concern. But again, we are waiting for more data on that. Now, fortunately, that data is forthcoming because a large study has just been instigated uh, this is called the post-hospitalization COVID-19 study. Now, as far as I know, so far, this is just taking hospitalized patients. I expect they will be taking non-hospitalized patients as a control. Um, that, that's their website there. Look it up. I'm going to play you a blast of this uh, video from Professor Chris Breitling. Um, but again, watch the whole video there for yourself. He's the lead academic in the study. Um, I think he's at Leicester University Medical Research or Bio Me Medical Research Centre, Leicester University. I'm not quite sure of the details, um, but uh, he's been funded by the Medical Research Council um, and and other funding bodies. So it's an official study to undertake, following up 10,000 people post COVID, and they're going to develop new uh, strategies for clinical care. So I think. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to play you all this video for copyright reasons, but we'll just we'll play a few minutes of uh, a Professor Breitling just to give us an idea of what his um, what he's thinking currently is and his plans for this for this project. I am Professor Chris Breitling at the University of Leicester. I'm really pleased to introduce to you the FOSP COVID consortium. We have all been touched by COVID-19, whether that's having to stay at home, whether it's affected a loved one, a family member, a colleague. And for many people, it's led to the need to go to hospital with very severe disease. Tragically, many people who've then gone to hospital have needed intensive care support and some have died. Fost COVID is focusing on those people who've been to hospital with COVID-19, have survived and have gone home. It's a great success story for those people, but what we don't fully understand is what happens next. It might be that those people have a full recovery. And in fact, that incident where they had severe COVID infection is just a memory. In some people, there may be additional problems. It may affect the lungs, as that's the organ where the COVID-19 infection starts. But we've also recognised that in some people, the infection can go beyond the lung in where it affects. It can affect blood vessels. It can affect the brain. In some people, it leads to chronic fatigue, chronic pain, depression, anxiety. It is because of this broad collection of possible problems that we really need to understand what's the scale of that burden of disease post COVID-19 hospitalization. So to try and answer that question, FOSP COVID has brought together a multidisciplinary team of experts. We're going to tackle the problem by assessing people in a standardised way. There will be detailed standardised questions, tests including imaging such as magnetic resonance imaging and CT scanning. And we shall also then 
embed this research into normal clinical care. So in essence, people will be coming into hospital for their care, but in addition will be invited to have further tests and questions in order to then participate in this research project. COVID is across the whole of the UK, including all of the four nations. And we're looking to recruit 10,000 individuals that have been hospitalised. Understanding the burden of COVID is really important, but it is not enough. That would just give us an indication of the scale of the problem, but won't give us the solution. So FOSP COVID wants to also then start to understand and implement solutions. Many people who have been in hospital with COVID-19 have participated in intervention trials. The most well known of those is the recovery study, which has recently shown phenomenal success with reductions in death in people who received the steroid dexamethasone. We will be including people who've participated in the recovery trial and other intervention studies for COVID-19 in hospital. This is really important. It's important because this might be part of the solution. We might find that some of the treatments given in hospital actually alter the trajectory, so alter okay. the outcomes okay. after you've gone home. I think we'll just it's leave the professor though, there. It's possible that we need. Am I working? I think I'm working, but my picture's not working. Let's try a different camera. No, anyway, I think you can hear me. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there for today. I'm not playing the whole video. It is it is on your link there for you to peruse at leisure. I'm just not sure if I'm allowed to play it off for copyright reasons. Let's just finish off with something from, um, this is from Ron in Wisconsin, which I quite like. So it's what he calls the uh, Swiss cheese model. So each of these interventions is going to make it less likely that the virus gets through to the people. Now, none of them are perfect on their own. They've all got holes in it, but together they're going to form an effective shield. So social distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, rapid testing, using your app, making sure you have good ventilation, all of those things would be good. Okay, so that's us for today. Quite why my picture is not moving, I'm not sure, but hopefully you can still hear me. And uh, yeah, that's us for this video. Thank you for tuning in as always.